Greetings. Welcome to In Conversation with Trevor, brought to you by the Nyaradzu Group. I go beyond the headlines and beyond the sensational. Today, I'm in conversation with David Crutenden, the former managing director of Unifred and a former board member of Zupco. Enjoy this informative conversation. David uh, Krutenden, welcome to In Conversation with Trevor. Thank you, Trevor. Good to be here. David, I, I thought that you and I need to have this conversation because of the chaos that has characterized our public transport system in Zimbabwe. You are involved with uh, uh, Rhodesia Members Company, you're involved with uh, Zubco, you sat on the board. Uh, for two terms. And I thought, I looked around and said, who amongst the living can uh, help us uh, come up with a solution as to how do we fix our public transport system? What goes through your mind, David, when you see the chaos that's out there right now? When you drove here, forget the potholes, but you saw people <laughs> waiting for transport all over the place. Uh, well, quite simply, Trevor, when the United Group sold its remaining 49%, of, of shares in uh, Zupco in 1995. As I took the check in one hand and released the share certificate in the other, I thought to myself, my head is telling me this is the right thing to do. My heart tells me this is going to be a disaster. Mm. And I'm afraid those thoughts have born fruit, unfortunately. Let's deal with both. This is the right thing to do. Why was it the right thing to do? It's a, a slightly complicated story, so I, I won't go into all of the detail, but the United Group, after independence, uh, and I was no part of the decision making, decided on the basis of experience in other countries that to have the government as a shareholder would, would be beneficial to both parties. The negotiations were extremely protracted and, and full of difficulties. And in the end, what turned out was that the government became 51% shareholder and United was in a minority with 49, although we had a management contract. Put quite simply, the relationship didn't prosper. Uh, it became extremely difficult and the government decided to terminate our management contract and the natural sequel to that was that we should we should dispose of the 49% of the shareholding mm. and your heart well although the company was was having severe difficulties uh, it was already in in financial difficulty um, nevertheless it, it, it was still providing a service um, the, the service was, was useful and I, I just felt that there was an awful likelihood that the whole thing would, would fall to bits mm. Mm. and unfortunately that's what's happened. You were right. You know, I, I, um, as I was researching, you know, the research took me back to the good old days. Growing up in uh, Magwegwe and uh, uh, in Wulawayo and attending Mziligazi High School, um, our bus was always on time. Quarter past seven in the morning. Um, we used, it was called ROC at that time, the Rhodesia Women Bus Company. It was on, on time. It wasn't crowded. It picked us up from school in the evening. There were a number of school buses. And as I was reading, I found that there was a lot of thought that was put into the uh, uh, the infrastructure. Talk to me about the 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 whole idea of putting this urban transport together and the role that Zubco, uh, the way it is structured and, and and the services that it, it provided and the thinking behind. Hmm. Is it commercially successful? How do you how do you make it successful? Well, to do that, Trevor, we we have to go back to 1948. Mm -hmm. um, 
when you weren't alive, but I was. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> a company called United Transport, which was a British company, um, had capital released as a result of nationalization of bus companies in the United Kingdom. It was a significant bus operator in the United Kingdom. And it was looking for new opportunities. And it perceived opportunities um, initially in passenger transport, but, but subsequently also significantly in freight transport um, in, in other countries, and particularly significantly in um, Africa south of the equator. And bus companies were developed um, and for a brief period operated under the United Banner in Kenya, Uganda, mm. Tanzania, Malawi, Zambia, what was still then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, uh, and South Africa. So th there was a very extensive, um, extensive bus operation and an extensive management knowledge. So the two key issues of capital uh, and ma management ability um, were there to be deployed. And the first deployment in this country was the purchase of, of a block of shares in what was then Rhodesia Omnibus, based in Bulawayo. Subsequently, United set up two other companies, um, one in Salisbury as it then was, Salisbury United, subsequently Harare United, and United Bus Services, which tended to operate more in the, in the rural market, although it had some urban services. And those were wholly owned, and Rhodesia Omnibus continued to be a quoted company on the stock exchange, although United was the majority shareholder. Mm. And for dual reasons, one, to enable uh, another shareholder to come in, and, and B, because of the way the tax laws work in this country. It was decided post-1980 to, to merge the passenger interests into one company, which became Zupco. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that, that's, that's, the broad, that's the broad history of it. And of course, the other feature of it is that uh, under the Urban Councils Act, um, franchises can be given to enable an operator to, to operate. Um, it, it's a type of monopoly uh, mm. because the operator becomes the sole provider of services, for instance, in Bulawayo or, or in Harare, um, but with the significant difference that it, has an, it does not have control of its pricing. Mm. Pricing, pricing was fixed um, originally because the franchises were given by the city councils. Fares were fixed by negotiation and discussion with the city councils, who had access to, to the financial information and, and so forth. And um, reading around this subject, I realized that uh, there, there were discussions with uh, the Salisbury uh, Omnibus Bus Company, the Bloy Omnibus Bus Company, and the city council would negotiate with the bus company in terms of uh, what the, f the fares are going to be. And that uh, the tendence, there tended to be a, a sense that uh, this was not an easy industry, that subsidies might come in to support uh, the, the, the bus services. Talk to me about, about the, the, the business model. Yes, the, the, the <clears throat> there are two words which, which loom large in, in, in this whole discussion. Uh, and which are still in use today, but in, in a, a very different form, but they need to be understood. One is the word franchise, and the other is the word subsidy. <laughs> now, the franchise granted the particular company the sole right to operate bus services in, in a given area. So that's a monopoly. It, it's a monopoly, but a monopoly with a twist in the tail. Mm -hmm because it comes with obligations. A, you must provide the services. You're not, you can't just do as you like. And B, the fares, uh, you, you, can't, um, you can't introduce fares at will. The fares must be agreed with the city councils. Mm -hmm. um, and one interesting feature of it, of course, is that wh when this was done originally, 
the franchises were, were negotiated with the individual city councils. So it was a form of devolution. Mm, I love that bit. I love that bit. Uh, and the franchises were actually different. That they had, that they they were they were built up in a different way. Um, so there were differences between Harare and Bulawayo. What were for the instance. differences? Um, in Harare, the company provided everything, its, its own depots and so forth. Um, the city council provided the actual locations of the termini, but bus shelters, um, if you can recall them before. Yes, I do. I mean, they were beautiful. <laughs> the bus shelters in Harare were the responsibility and belonged to the company. In Bulawayo, the depots belonged to the city council, um, and I guess they probably still do. Mm. And the, and, the, and the city council was responsible for bus shelters and termini and so forth. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a difference in the capital structure. Right. And um, the, the, there were instance, instances where, so the agreements, uh, part of the agreements rather uh, in Harare and Bulawaya were, you know, if we make a profit, we're going to share. If we make a loss, you're going to come, uh, the city council is going to come in and uh, and pay a subsidy. Talk to me about that structure and that business model. Um, so far as I'm aware, um, there wasn't a profit sharing feature. Okay. The idea was that the company should make a reasonable profit. Um, and if the profits fell below a certain level measured in terms of return on capital by an agreed formula, then a subsidy would be payable. Now, to the best of my knowledge, no subsidies were ever paid. Okay. There may have been some claims in the late 1970s, but they were subsequently dropped. So I, I don't think that any subsidy was ever paid. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think the interesting feature is that uh, in Salisbury, a bleak Harare, um, the, the intention always was, I think, to keep the fares as low as possible. Mm. Uh, in fact, at, at one point, the fares at the weekend were higher than the fares during the week, which is rather counterintuitive. Mm. But uh, there was more flexibility over, over fare levels at the weekend. And of course, then the, well, there was a group of services called the first class services, which really didn't differ very much, but that's what they were called which operated to the low density suburbs and they weren't part of the mm. franchise they right. had they had a different uh, their fares were fixed by the company mm. uh, but they they ran to uh, you know, greencroft mabel rain highlands borrowdale greystone park um, the low, what we would now call the low density suburbs and i suppose the thinking with raising the fees over the weekend was that it's a luxury. I mean, you have a choice whether to travel uh, over no. the weekend, although Monday to Friday you're going to, to the office, you're going to yeah. work. It's part of the economy, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. That's right. The, the, and and the, the franchise paid fees to the city for use of roads, uh, ETC. Was, did that happen during your time or that was before your time? I mean, no. I'm looking at 1952, sorry, 1952. Golly. Yeah. I, f I went as far back as that piggy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't recall that we ever we, we ever paid um, fees. paid fees. No, I mean there would be there would be the standard license fees for the vehicles, right. which of course in those days went to went went to the municipal authorities. Mm. Um, you know, prior to the inception of Zinara. Mm. So there you are, David. You holding the share certificate and the check and your heart and your mind are telling you two different things and your heart turns out to be right. The thing has collapsed. There's an effort to resuscitate it. Talk to me about the collapse. You saw this happen. What happened? Well, es essentially the, the, co the company was very weak financially. Um, it, it had become dependent on bank finance really for normal operations, which is no way to run a business. And the demand was growing. Um, and we, we need to recollect that the city 25 years ago was radically different from what we to the city of today. 
And if you go back to the inception of the, 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 the franchises in, in the, 19, the 1950s, 70 years ago nearly, radically, radically different. So I, th I think there are, there are three things which, mm. which stand out in my mind, Trevor, uh, and those are policy, finance, and management. Mm. And they're intertwined, but they need, they, they're the key issues. Now, the problem overall, if we look at transport as a whole in the country, <clears throat> not just the urban transport problem, is that we, we lack a coherent transport policy. Mm -hmm. We don't have one. Uh, in fact, we, I don't think I can recall us ever having one. I don't, I don't remember. It's, um, it might be somewhere, yeah, some but, draw or something. But it's, it's something which is, which is essentially not there. Um, so unless you have a clear idea of what, what you're trying to do, um, you're bound, you are bound to have problems sooner or later. Now, assuming you know what you want to do through policy, you've then got to decide how you're going to finance it. Now, the, the problem that Zopco ran into was that the minority shareholder, United, felt that it was not getting a very good deal and therefore was not willing to subscribe more capital. And the government, in effect, was not in a position to, to, to subscribe more capital. So but this issue of finance um, is a fundamental problem. And as you know from comments made in, in one of your newspapers, um, the government does not own 100% of Zopco. The government owns 51% of Zopco, which is what it, what it acquired under the subscription agreement from United. The remaining 49% um, was sold at government request to Zimri hmm. at quite short notice, but it was all done above board, there's nothing. Um, but of course at that time Zimri was government controlled. Uh, Zimri is not now government it's controlled. A but it does own 49% of Zupco, hmm. and presumably is not very keen on subscribing <laughs> fresh capital. I don't know, but, uh, but uh, that's a guess. Um, and we've seen from what's happening with Zupco at present that, that, that fresh capital hasn't been injected into the company. Uh, buses are coming in all sorts of ways. Um, so the finance remains a very, a very key issue, and it has been all along. Um, I mean, if I take you back to the mid '80s, at that time, a World Bank study was done on sit develop cities in developing countries, mm. um, and Harare was chosen. Uh, there were comparable cities in India and elsewhere, and the conclusion was that. Although the fare in Harare measured in cents per passenger kilometer was quite low and definitely on a par with, with other countries, mm. the percentage of people's income that was spent on transport was high compared to the other countries. Mm. And, and that's obviously because of the historical dispersion mm particularly of, 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 the, of the working population. So th there is a fundamental problem uh, in financing urban bus companies in this country, and presumably in other countries, that you want to keep the fares low, but if you want to keep the fares low, you've got to decide how else mm. you're going to come in um, to make the company viable. And that's, that's not been addressed, mm. and that's, that's a key problem. And now we have this slightly strange situation where the word subsidy is applied. Um, the government is paying money through Zupco to private operators and some presumably to Zupco for operating some sort of bus service. How much is not clear. It's not, <clears throat> certainly hasn't been reported to Parliament for some time. Uh, 
it didn't feature as a budget item mm. um, last year. So it, it's all somewhat opaque, shall we say. What, what would, then there's, there's the management piece. The management, well, you can't run a good bus service without effective management, and that's operational management and the management of the bus fleet. Mm. You've got to look after the buses, you've got to make them last. You can't be buying replacement buses every five years. You know, a bus should last 10 or 15 years at least, if it's properly looked after. The operational management manifests itself in things like your school bus, which was always there and did what it was required to do. Uh, the essence yeah. of a service, mm. something that you can rely on. Mm. Uh, and these days, there don't appear to be any published timetables. Mm. The buses you see on the road, you know, think things are happening, but I don't suppose anybody quite knows what or when. Buses at timetables were tickets that we bought in advance. Um, and we had uh, bus drivers who were polite and, and professional who kept time, uh, had some form of etiquette. So, David, the thing's broken. Um, and I tend to see more uh, broken down buses rather than buses that are actually in service. Particularly if you go to the Zupo headquarters, you'll see the majority are uh, standing on bricks or something of that sort. How does this thing get fixed? Can it be fixed? What's the solution to the chaos in public transport at the present moment? Well, the fundamental first step is there must be a policy. I mean, at present it seems to me that there's an expectation that ZUPCO should be all things to all men. It should be urban, it should be rural, and it should be intercity. Now, if finance is constrained, that can't be achieved. Yeah. So that there needs to be a clear policy as, as to how it's to be done. And if you look at the way the city has developed, um, I think the existing model doesn't work. Because I think for Harare, for instance, you're now talking about an area which stretches from Rua to Norton from Harare south to Caledonia, probably as far as near Bira on the, on the uh, Kariba Road. Um, you're talking of a very, very large area, a much larger area than was ever contemplated before. So you need to decide, is one company really capable of doing that? Can it be financed? Should it be separated um, and should there be areas operated by a particular company or, or, or business? Um, should there be a completely different model of, of how, how the thing works? Um, I don't think you could go back to the old franchise agreements because I don't think the capability of controlling them exists in the city councils mm -hmm. or probably even in the Ministry of Local Government. So should there be a thought for some form of passenger transport authority which covers Greater Harare? Because you've got the problem now that the, the, the city overlaps into, into neighboring areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know there's, there's an issue with Caledonia, for instance, mm -hmm. which, which falls under Goromonzi, and, and so on. And the, so, is there, a, 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 is there a case for considering some sort of overall authority? Mm -hmm. And what would, that, what would that do? How would it work? Um, would the individual companies collect their own fares or would they be collecting money on behalf of the, of the authority, mm -hmm. which would then pay the companies? Mm -hmm. You can do that through a, through a route tendering type of thing. Yeah. And also, I mean, the great thing that's happened in the last 15 years or so is electronic fare collection. I, mean, I don't think tickets are, are necessary. 
I think, widespread widespread use of tap and go, tap and go mm -hmm. prepaid cards. Mm. And also, that means that, for instance, companies that are paying transport allowances might very well be able to purchase the prepaid mm. bus ticket, which would then channel people to the bus services and away from these alternative methods which exist at present. As Nyaradzo, we strive to continuously bring convenience to our clients. Nyaradzo Group is proud to introduce Sawi, a new virtual chatbot assistant on WhatsApp. With Sawi, you are now able to interact with us from the comfort of your home and can be assisted anytime via WhatsApp. With life assurance products, diaspora products, applying and assessing your policy, payment platforms, claims information and any other queries concerning payments, policy information or products and services. Simply WhatsApp Sawi on plus 263-712-992892 or visit the link showing on the screen to register and start interacting and receiving notifications from Sawi on WhatsApp. Now, join in and experience a new level of convenience 24 hours a day with Sawi. David, what would you say? I mean, I'm no expert in this, expert in this but uh, when I was reading about the model, um, the old model, I said to myself, surely having this Zupco with a national footprint, uh, which it is battling to fulfill, is not the way to go. Why not break it into pieces, like you're saying, you know, um, tendering for roots? And, and go back to saying, we have available service for Bulawayo and the other outlying areas, Gwanda, we have a service for Mtare, Midlands, uh, Harare, and, and, and so forth. And there's 10 of them or nine of them, depending on maybe go provincial. Let's go out to tender and let's make sure that uh, uh, only one company, maybe not limit, don't limit, allow the market to decide who's got the capacity, who's got the capacity, the expertise, the finance uh, to, 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 to run this franchise. What, what's your pushback on that? Oh, I think that's, that's, uh, that's probably the way to go. Th th there's one thing that, that one has to be very careful of. I'm, I'm a great supporter in, in general terms of, of private enterprise and, and public, publicly raised capital. But urban passenger transport services are are a very tricky area. And if you look, I mean, we, we, we talk about Harare more than anywhere else, but if, if you look at what is happening in Harare at present, you have unbridled free enterprise. It's called Combis and Mushika Shika. And it is chaos. Total chaos. Horrible, very unsafe. Unhygienic. Un unsafe. Un everything. <laughs> and it, the same thing has happened before. M many, many years ago, there were similar, uh, similar situations in the United Kingdom where there were multiple companies providing omnibus services and the vehicles raced one another mm. to get to the, the next stop first to get the passengers. So some form of regulation and control is, is very necessary, I think. And the, the franchise, in terms of the Urban Councils Act, not this so-called franchise at present, provided that because there was a sole operator responsible to a sole body, being mm. the municipality, with a sole purpose. Mm. And it, it was monitored and, and, and enforced. So I, I think you have to be very careful about, about having multiple, mm. multiple people. It, it needs to be structured. Um, so that a proper service can be run uh, and people can understand what, what's going on. Mm. I get the, the point that you're making, David, that the main plank is going to be a policy. Mm. And what does that policy speak to? And what are you trying to achieve? 
uh, you, for me, this is part of uh, oiling the wheels of the economy. Make sure that people get from home and work uh, as quickly, as safely as possible. And that ought to be a, a very big piece of what we're talking about if we're trying to resolve uh, the economic crisis that we have at the, at the moment. What's the view on that? Uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, l let's, let's, let's take a, a couple of obvious indicators. Sure. Uh, number one, congestion. Mm -hmm. Now, we know from historical experience that a standard bus, carefully designed and, and meeting legal requirements, 12 and a half meters long, 2.65 meters wide, can carry 101 people legally. 76 seated, 25, 26, 25 standing. 25 I remember standing. That. <laughs> that's, that's the legal bus. Now, you, you can have a bigger bus, but I think that would be unwieldy. You can have articulated buses, but they have, they have problems um, in terms of safety with, with other road users. So just thinking of a conventional bus. So you've got 101 people in, in a legal vehicle occupying 40-something square meters of road space. How many Mushika Shika, how many combis uh, lead, uh, loaded legally, mm. let alone the illegal loading, how many would that bus replace? You know, it's not a simple equation, but uh, there would be a significant difference in the road space occupied per passenger carried. So that must, a decent bus service must surely relieve some of the congestion. And, and congestion uh, wastes time and therefore incurs an economic cost. Congestion burns more fuel, causes more pollution. Um, it, 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 it's a generally undesirable undesirable thing. It certainly makes the roads very unsafe because drivers resort to all this crazy behavior. I, mean, I sometimes say to myself that Zimbabwe leads the world in driverless vehicles. <laughs> Frightening. Because they are unfortunately combis and mushika shika mm. and not a few other vehicles which should know better. Uh, I, I call them shaka shaka by the way. Uh, um, I don't know why. So yeah, it's it's a it's a it's an it's a nightmare. Um, is um, trains are trains the solution? Trains are very expensive, very very big capital cost. Uh, I mean, let's discount this thing that's going on at present. I mean, that's antique rolling stock, probably dangerous, inappropriate locomotives. Um, station facilities which which aren't aren't any good. I mean, if you want rapid loading and unloading, you've got to have a platform at floor height of the carriage. The carriage doors are narrow, so you can't get in and out easily. The signaling system doesn't work. Um, so, if you want a proper urban rail service, you're talking about a good deal of money. Mm. Now, it's possible. Is it not worth? <coughs> I, th I think the problem is that if you look at if you look at urban rail services in other countries, the population density is high. Mm. You know, here, the city is at ground level essentially. The population is very spread out, whereas um, in other cities, the population's up in the air. Now, whether that's desirable or not is mm. another matter, but it it affects the way it affects the way you operate. But I think there's a case for thinking about doing something with the existing railway line, but I think that the Chitanguiza railway line would, would turn out to be incredibly expensive. And you've got to remember that one of the problems of urban passenger transport is the peak. You get this surge in the morning, morning you get the surge in the, the afternoon, morning. not a lot in, the, mm. in between. So if you cater for the surges, you've got a lot of equipment standing mm idle in the middle part of the day. So that has a very severe financial impact. And what may look absolutely wonderful to begin with 
10 or 15 years mm. in, in the future may, may turn out to be an appalling burden. So, What, what does um, international best practice tell us in terms of uh, how to structure a functioning urban transport system that includes all the elements? that we've spoken about, um, buses, um, trains? There has to be a service which people want to use. That, that's the fundamental. So you have to have, you have, to have a working service. Mm. You can then do things like discouraging car use. Right. If you take... Um, some cities in, in Western Europe, I'm not sure about other countries, but, but certainly in Western Europe, congestion charges, mm. banning cars from, mm. from, from certain parts of cities. In other words, directing people to, the, the, public to the public system. But the public system has to be good and it has to work. Um, other, otherwise, you're in, you're in trouble. Mm. Mm. But right now, we're in total chaos, aren't we? It's certainly not good. Mm. It's certainly not good. Um, yeah, and, uh, I wouldn't like to travel in most of the vehicles that people are being asked mm. to travel in. Mm. Mm. Wonderful. I mean, uh, we we clearly the this is a big heavy lifting stuff, which is hugely important uh, as part of uh, you know our economic recovery. If there has to be, if this is not done properly. Um, we talk of congestion, but the, the, my heart goes out to uh, workers who, are, who start waiting for transport uh, uh, at 5 p.m. when they knock off and finally get transport at uh, 9 mm. p.m., uh, get home and be ready for 4 a.m. to come, to come. That can be a productive it's awful. workforce. It's awful. It's awful. I mean, you, you can only feel very sorry for people who are subjected to that. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's just, it's horrible. Um, and it's ultimately unsafe because people crush into, into vehicles. So the vehicles are, are, are overloaded, whether they're small cars or combis or buses. Mm. And my guess is that a lot of the buses that are being used at present aren't equipped for urban transport. Mm. So they don't have grab rails, you know, standing passengers, if there was an accident, would have nothing to hold on I to. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, so the whole safety, the whole safety issue is, uh, and, and coupled to safety is enforcement. Mm. I mean, there are rules. Uh, there are rules and they are being broken uh, quite, quite openly. Uh, Regulations that are not uh, supervised for implementation. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if if we went to the side of the road somewhere and really got to work with a vehicle inspector and a policeman, we would decimate the Mashika Shika and combi fleets. We're putting into harm's way the young people. I see young people getting into Mashaka Shaka boots, um, mm. uh, smoke and that kind of stuff. It mm. breaks my heart. Why mm. there hasn't been a politician that has decided to, to seize this as something that needs to be done just surprises it, me. It's very strange because uh, <clears throat> the other day I was sorting out some papers at home and I came across a Hansard from 2004 and in it was a report of a parliamentary committee the Parliamentary Committee on Transport, talking about urban transport and all of the problems that we are seeing today were contained in that report, and that's 17 years ago. Mm. And they were all there. We know what needs to be done. It's the courage of... Uh... We, have a, we have a fair idea, I think. Mm. Um, yeah. David, let me... You were born in the UK. Mm. Mm. Just talk about that. I mean, the, 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 the my birth. The, the, <laughs> the transport sea thing is absolutely <laughs> depressing, uh, David. You were born in the UK. Where were you educated? In the UK. Where? where, where which school? I was. At, I was. I was at a little prep school in North Yorkshire, 
from the age of, of nine to mm -hmm. 13, and then the public school in Cambridge um, for my secondary education, and then, then at university in Cambridge. And Cambridge, what did you study in Cambridge? Was it engineering? Yes, and it was technically called mechanical sciences, mm -hmm. but it was engineering. Mm -hmm. And what, what brought you into Rhodesia, into the then Rhodesia? Um, almost a fluke. Fluke? <laughs> yes. Life is fascinating, isn't it? Amazing. My wife was born here, and she spent all but about six years of her life in this country. And in 19, we met and were married in England. In 1975, her parents were thinking of, of leaving the country. And uh, so we came on holiday. I'd, I'd never been here. And while we were on holiday, one evening we were walking with some family friends. And the friend said, why don't you look for a job? And I said, well, I'm, I'm on holiday. I'm you know, not really thinking about looking for jobs. And he said, let, let, me, let me fix up some interviews. And I was working for the railway in England at the time. And so I, I went to Bulawayo and, and, and met the railway people. And then the telephone rang and he said, there's a company called United Transport uh, and they'd like to meet you. So I went down met the group secretary, and then a couple of days later, he rang up and said, the chief executive would, would like to meet you. And uh, so I, I went along, uh, and I was offered a job hmm. um, as what was then called an executive trainee. Um, so I said, well, I'm on holiday. We'll go back to England and, and, and think about it. And uh, th that's what we did, uh, and I must say, um, my wife brought no pressure on me. There was no family pressure, uh, and, but we decided to to give it a go. Mm. And forty-five years later, is it? Uh, it'll be forty-six. 46 I, I started work with United Transport the first of April, nineteen seventy-six. And then you, nineteen eighty, you were appointed general manager of Swift. Yes, the main part of Swift. Yeah. Yep. Is Swift still around? Yes. Still yes, going. oh, still going. Yes, it was, yes. It was a big part of uh, moving goods and services in this country. Oh, I and think you 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 were, you headed it for for some time. Yes, yeah, I, I think. I mean, I, I think it's it, it's part of the economic fabric. Um, we built it up into a into a network which served sixty odd destinations. Most of them were served overnight, so. Economically, it was it was an efficient, an efficient sort of business, uh, and many companies came to to absolutely rely on it. So, again, it was the whole idea of a service. I mean, we were we were providing a service. We undertook to collect goods today and to deliver them tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and then you uh, became uh, managing director of Unifreight in 1984. Yes. Yeah. So that was that was. Swift and our contract division, Bulwark, um, which which did both contract freight and and latterly contract passenger work as well, uh, and then after the after the sale of the uh, shares in uh, Zupco, we undertook to redeploy that money and it, within Zimbabwe, and we we created Blue Arrow, which was the first modern luxury coach service. Um, in the country, so we introduced a completely new style of mm. uh, of, of vehicle mm. to but the market. Blue Arrow is no longer there now, is it still there? No, no. no I think it, it, it's got overtaken by events. I mean, mm. the, it was it was a premium service, and, and the whole intercity market has changed radically. Mm. Mm. Well, but I used to use uh, Blue Arrow quite a lot, commuting between Bulawayo and, and Harare. Then 1991, you appointed uh, Group Chief Executive for the United Transport Group. That yeah. then got you into sitting on the board of uh, Zubko for yes. two terms. Yes, ba back again, yes. Yeah. I, I was on the board prior to, to the government becoming a shareholder, mm -hmm. so between 1986 and I think 1988, and then from 1991 to 1995, mm -hmm. um, I was back on the board um, obviously, as a representative of a minority shareholder, mm. 
and, and the person responsible for the management contract. And w w one thing that I found um, that I would want to talk to you about is you are passionate about the value of uh, professional and industry-based uh, organizations and you're quite active within the transport, uh, transport sector. Talk to me about that passion. Where does it come from? Has it profited you? Oh, yes, uh, immensely, yes. Um, I mean, although I'm speaking purely as an individual uh, and, and not in any way as a representative of, of those two bodies, um, but um, I'm a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and mm. Transport, which is really the, the main international professional body for people in transport and logistics. Um, and it's indicative of the way United approached its business that I was required to become our member and to study for the exams. Uh, it wasn't an option. I was told, you will do it. <laughs> um, Speak to the management part of things. So I, I, think, I think professional organizations are very important for the development of, of, of the individual mm. within 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 the the the, the, the whole mm. so you you are you are a member of uh, you've been chairman actually of the transport operators operators association you have found a chairman of uh, the national employment council for the transport industry you have found a chairman of federation of southern african transport associations and like you've said you are a fellow of the institute of chartered logistic and, and transport. Talk to me now. I mean, being in this space, um, David, can be easy. You know, for me, what are the hurdles? Uh, the, the, the state of the roads, uh, the fuel situation. Uh, when I drove to the office this morning, there's queues uh, somewhere in Greston Park for, for, for fuel. The um, fees that, are, that come from all sides of, uh, of, of the business, what's the environment like? for within your space? Well, it, it's difficult. <laughs> it, it's difficult. Um, but, but I think the, the fact that the, the, the Transport Operators Association of Zimbabwe uh, represents um, freight carriers. Uh, it, it's open, it's open to uh, it, it, it's open to any company in the transport business, but uh, the, the, the bus operators have tended to have their own association. Uh, and Zupco ha, um, has been a member from time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, you know, going back um, to, to former times, uh, the United Bus Companies were, were very strong members. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the importance is that, that the industry has a voice. Mm -hmm. It can make representations on, on where the problems are uh, and participate in trying to find solutions. Um, the, the, the general manager has been very much involved recently um, uh, in, in getting the new facility at Bike Bridge mm. to work. Um, so I, I think it, it's very important because it, these associations bring together a pool of experience and um, if the relationship works well, they then have an interface mm. with with government and, and other and other bodies uh, to, to to put forward a, a point of view, mm. um, which, which say, I think is very important. You say it's difficult, David. Um, I've cited the fuel and the roads. What other challenges is the uh, is, is the sector facing? Um, this is a very high cost country, Trevor. Um, and, and one of the problems is the number of, of charges and fees which are levied on transport operators. And it's something which, which the, the TOA has been pursuing for some time. Um, and in fact, I think we can take credit for, uh, although I was uh, merely a committee member, I was not, not in any way directly involved. I think we can take credit for um, stimulating this whole approach on ease of doing business mm. because uh, we made a, a representation to the office of the president of the cabinet saying look this is this is what we're faced with what can we do to simplify this talk, talk to me talk to me about the fees break them down what fees are you having to pay 
Well, you, you've got the fees you would expect to pay, which are, are, are licenses, mm -hmm. permits, mm -hmm. certificates of fitness and things mm. like that. But then there's a whole raft of, of, of other things like. which happen mm -hmm. um, at the borders, the, the, the various public health regulations. Um, there's, a, there's a whole string of them. Um, unfortunately, I haven't, got, I haven't got them locked in my mind, but we're still pursuing, wow. we're still pursuing um, environmental management um, authority. It's almost as if uh, one pays for the government through one's taxes and then pays again through all these fees. It's a sort of, it's a sort of double whammy. Fascinating that you, you raise that issue, David, because um, I was speaking to uh, John Robertson on this show and uh, one of uh, the disincentives to investment that John cited a number of times are these fees mm. that uh, businesses are subjected to, which act as a deterrent to people considering investing into in, in this country? Is that your sense then? Yes, I mean, if, if you if you take the regional market, which is where most Zimbabwean transport operators are are, are working now, because of of the constriction of the local economy. The, the rates in those market in those markets are are fixed on a regional basis, um, and they may be viable for operators from other countries and not viable for operators from Zimbabwe or less viable. Um, and n nobody moving cargo is going to take pity and say, "Oh no, well." You know, poor Zimbabweans, you've got such a terrible problem that we're going to pay you more. <laughs> you know, you've got to compete. Li life, life doesn't work like that. Um, so getting costs down, uh, and, and, you know, and it, it, it's, it's not just all these fees. Uh, it, it's things like having to have generators to provide power to run your workshops if, if the mains electricity isn't there, or having to have a borehole because mm. piped water isn't there. There's, there's an enormous amount of, of background cost, which we've all come to accept as sort of normal, but it, it's, it's actually not normal. Mm. Are you, so you've, you've said you've made representations to mm. the Office of uh, President and Cabinet. Mm. Are you making any headway? Well, a certain amount of headway has been made, and of course now it's moved it's moved f from the OPC to the, um, what is the investment authority called? Oh, right, uh, ZIDA, Zida. Zida. Zimbabwe yeah. Investment Development Authority. It falls yeah. under them. Yeah, okay. Which I think um, should, should be good because, right. I mean, the, the, they're talking about investment. If they're talking about investment, they're talking about private sector mm -hmm. investment. And so making, making the thing attractive is, is um, is, is a good a idea. Priority. Mm -hmm. Do, the, does the transport um, um, association or the sector that you're in, do, do you have a view in that we missed out on the Kazungula Road and, and rail as an industry? Oh. Does this matter to you? Should you have... No, I, I'm, uh, we, we, we warned the government about Kazangula when it was first mooted. We said, be careful here. There's a possibility that you will lose transit movement through the country uh, and the associated fees. Personally, and I stress this is a personal view, mm -hmm. uh, not the view of any particular organization. Um, I, I'm not averse to the Kazangula Bridge. I, I would be quite happy to see less vehicles transiting Zimbabwe. <laughs> Why, David? Because of congestion, mm. because of road safety. Mm. If you have, as I have, nearly been eliminated on the escarpment by a truck overtaking on a corner going downhill, um, you'd be happy to see less. Mm. I, I, don't think, I don't think anybody has really come up with anything which says there is real value to Zimbabwe in having all these trucks transiting. Mm. Um, we are as we are. We we are geographically placed that the transit way, yeah. cargo will happen. Mm. But if there's if there's a second route, um, I, I'm not I'm not averse to that. 
Uh, is, and is it a disadvantage to the local industry that we are not part of that uh, deal? It's not a disadvantage so long as our border posts function okay. properly. Which is which is not functioning properly. No, I mean the, the, the you know we we wait to see now that this new border post is functioning at Bight Bridge if vehicles really get through, mm. uh, but. Effectively, we've been talking about the same problems at the borders for 15 years. Mm. Mm. They're not new. Mm. David, it's, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure knowing you um, and your, your good fun. Love your <laughs> wicked sense of humor. I'm saddened to hear that you are living. Why are you living uh, in the country? Pu purely, purely a personal thing, uh, Trevor. It, it's, it's, it's not a question of saying I've had enough or, 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 or being forced to do that. Um, purely, purely personal issues. Uh, okay. and, and, and obviously I, I, will, I will go with a great, with a great deal of regret. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I hope I shall be visiting from time to time. Uh, we you, hope you, so. you won't escape, Trevor. <laughs> We hope so. David, <laughs> let's get to the books now. So the book club, um, Trevor Book Club, uh, is, is a very popular part of uh, this show, David, and I'm going to put you on the spot. I know you read a lot. Uh, what books have you read that have let, left an indelible mark on you and you want to recommend to our global audience? Oh, Lord. Three at least, David. <laughs> <laughs> you, you sent me that yesterday. Yeah. And you know my reply. How yeah. do you, how how do you, you know, know I, I can read? read? <laughs> and I'll tell you why I sent you that reply. Because there's a short story by Somerset Maugham called The Verger, which is about a man who was the verger of its fiction of a fashionable church in London. And after many years, it is discovered that he can neither read nor write. And uh, he's, he's discharged from employment. And he works out on his way home that he sees streets. And this, bear in mind, is a, is a, is a social scenario many, many years ago. He sees streets which do not have a, to a shop which sells tobacco, cigarettes, and sweets. And so he sets up a shop. Mm -hmm. And it does well, and he sets up another shop, and he does well. And in the end, he has a chain of these little shops. And he goes to see his bank manager, who says, you've got a lot of money. Um, what are you going to do with it? Mm. And uh, he says, well, um, uh, let me leave that to you. You, you do that. Um, and the bank manager says, why, why is that? And uh, he said, well, um, to tell you the truth, um, I can't read or write. <laughs> and the bank manager says, how have you managed this business not being able to write? And he said, well, in order to run the business, I have learned to write my name. <laughs> I was t telling you about your wicked sense of humor, David. So, so um, I, I, I thought about th three sort of areas. Uh, uh, novels, um, I, I really like the novels of Jane Austen. Mm. Mm. I think they're delightful, they're, 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 they're funny, they give a lot of insight into society and, and social order and the way relationships work. And also, I mean, in the which, same... Which one is your favorite, uh, Joel Austin? I think, I, I think it would be a close run between Pride and Prejudice and mm. Sense and Sensibility, mm. 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 both of which have been made into wonderful films, of course, which makes it easy. So probably Jane Austen as a novelist, although plenty of other novelists would, would run close second or third. Uh, then, then there's a book called The Endurance uh, by a lady called Charlotte Robertson, which is a record of, of the expedition that Ernest Shackleton made. Mm. <clears throat> in, uh, I think he left England in 1913. Um, and his objective was to be the first man to make the crossing of Antarctica from one side to the other. Uh, Amundsen had reached mm. the pole. Mm. <clears throat> uh, the, the expedition did not succeed because his ship was trapped in the pack ice. The ship was crushed and sank. 
And so there he was on the pack ice with his men. And nobody knew where he was. There was no communication. And he brought that whole party back to safety. Wow. It's an absolute epic uh, of, of, of um, polar travel. Endurance. Uh, navigation, mm. because he had to cross open water um, twice <laughs> to, to get uh, to rescue. Um, so the whole thing is an astonishing account uh, of something. But what is also interesting to me is that in recent years, <coughs> It's become a bit of a favorite with management educators who right, say that this, really? is, this is a book about leadership. Mm. And it is a book about leadership. I, I don't really like management texts very much. <coughs> I, don't think you, I don't think you learn management from books. But, you learn by doing it. But, but that, that book it is a wonderful, it, it has this dual thing. Mm. It's this wonderful, astonishing adventure and achievement, but also how he did it. Mm. So that, that. That's your second book. That's number two. Mm. Then number three, I find politics very interesting and politicians. Um, From a distance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have no ambition in that direction, <laughs> That's what I shall meant. we say. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> I mean, uh, the, the, obvi the obvious man is Churchill. Mm -hmm. um, there, there are several good biographies of him, one, vo one volume ones, let alone the official one. Um, and it, you know, he's such an interesting figure because... Which is your favorite book? Well, which is your favorite biography there? Um, but the, the most recent one is by a man called Andrew Roberts, mm -hmm. um, which, which is good. But the Roy Jenkins book, which is has mm. the more political mm. slant mm. to I, it. I've got that one. Is interesting. Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, Churchill was a very strange character. I mean, if you said, if I said to you, um, the man we're going to have running the country uh, consumes copious amounts of alcohol, chain smokes, smokes heavily, and is suffer, uh, suffers from fits of depression, mm. You wouldn't think that he was necessarily. That's not, that's not a CV for election. That. <laughs> and and you know his political career was was studied with some mm. serious mistakes. Mm. Um, so it, you know from that point of view it's interesting, but the parallel book um, about Clement Attlee, mm. Citizen Clem, is very interesting because uh, they were more or less political contemporaries. Mm actually replaced Churchill at yeah. the end of the Second World War was, although he wasn't the first Labour Party Prime Minister, he was the first, you, you would call the socialist Prime Minister. He introduced the National mm. Health Service. Mm. He nationalised various parts of the economy. Um, so very, very interesting. And you have the contrast of uh, Churchill coming from a patrician background and Attlee, who was ed educated at a public school mm. and at Oxford, and slowly gravitated from, I don't know what you would call liberal conservatism, to, to socialism. Mm. So they, 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 it's a very interesting... They're interesting characters, yeah. interesting leaders. Yeah. Um, David, thank you so much for uh, coming all. onto the show. I am sad that you're leaving the country next year. Um, you have been uh, a good friend and uh, no doubt a, a great citizen. Your passion for the transport sector, I think, uh, uh, and what you've been able to do is going to be sorely missed. But we wish you all the best as Thanks. you settle down and you're welcome as a tourist. And I've got somewhere to go when I need to travel to Scotland. Absolutely. Eh? <laughs> Anywhere. Anywhere. <laughs> David, allow me to tend to our viewers who are all over the world thank you so much for uh, supporting this show and for making it the success that it has become remember we are a weekly show we are out on mondays on youtube at 7 a.m central african time to ensure that you never miss out on any of these quality conversations i invite you to click on this red button and subscribe you'll get a notification every time we have one of these quality conversations and we've gone a step further by the way We've got uh, uh, a link, uh, if you roll below this video, a link to a podcast uh, of this conversation 
for your listening pleasure. And we read all your comments, uh, the criticism, the praise that doesn't go on to, into our heads. Uh, we thank you for supporting us. Until next time, cheers to you all.